we have been looking at stress intensity factor for variety of geometries and in the last class we had looked at the problem of collinear cracks evenly spaced in an infinite strip and I said from an academic point of view it would look like an extension of uh, writing a stress function to a fictitious problem. However, what we saw in the last class was using the solution of this problem we could construct solutions for a CCT specimen central crack retention specimen by taking the cuts here and if you cut it along the y axis and in between this you will be able to get a single edge notched specimen and if you cut it along the y axis here and also along the y axis here you will get the specimen of double edged crack. And one of the issues which I pointed out to you in the last class was a comparison between a center crack specimen and a single edge notch specimen. In the case of a center crack specimen because of symmetry you need to have the slope to remain horizontal here. On the other hand when I cut this there is no restraint on this in view of this the crank will open up more and this will also not necessarily be at 0 degrees the slope will not be at 0 degrees. And what is the implication of this the implication is you will have a higher value of stress intensity factor in those class of problems and this is labeled as a back free surface with respect to the crack tip and you will essentially have a factor of 1.1215. Many times people just use it as 1.12 and this is known as a back free surface correction factor. This kind of a concept you will see you know our focus is to graduate from throw the thickness cracks to surface cracks because surface cracks are more realistic. We learn concepts from throw the thickness crack then we carry forward. See in the last class we had looked at uh, stress intensity factor for the center crack specimen as well as a single edge notch specimen. Now you have the solution for double edge crack this is a finite specimen and here again you have the definition of k1 as sigma root pi a multiplied by the function f1 and you will find several people have given the function f. Bentham and Cotier have given the function f1 as 1 plus 0 0.122 cos squared pi alpha divided by 2 whole multiplied by square root of 2 by pi alpha tan pi alpha divided by 2 and alpha is defined as 2 a by w and for such an expression the accuracy is put as plus or minus 0 0.8 percent for any value of alpha. And one thing you will have to keep in mind when I go from infinite geometry to finite geometry like the stress concentration factor increases stress intensity factor also increases that is the reason why you have to find out SIF for finite geometries if it is less than what is there in the infinite geometry then as an upper bound people will do the calculation and then carry on with it. Because the stress intensity factor would increase in a finite geometry you have to necessarily evaluate this and as the problem is complex you will have multiple solution. You have the factor given by Bentham and Coiter you also have another the set of expressions given by Nishitani the function f1 is little more elaborate and you find the accuracy has improved from 0 0.8 percent to plus or minus 0 0.5 percent and the function f1 is given as 1.122 minus 
0 0.154 alpha plus 0 0.807 alpha square minus 1.894 alpha cube plus 2.494 alpha power 4. So, now you are ready. See way back in the beginning of the course somewhere around 10 classes, we have taken up a problem of a center crack and a double edge crack and then we were questioning which crack is more critical. At that time you were not armed with the calculation of SIF. So, we had only seen an experimental result and when we did it what happened? The fracture started at the double edge crack. Now, you are having equations, I have also asked you to bring your calculators. I would like you to go back to that problem and then evaluate the value of SIF for a center crack as far as a double edge crack for the situation when the center crack is I think it is 18 millimeter and the double edge crack take the case of 8.5 millimeter. Double edge crack summation is shorter than the center crack. So, this is the problem. I have the center crack, I have double edge crack and the question is which of the cracks is critical. See when common sense fails you have to depend on science, you have to develop the mathematics and since you have the mathematics it is possible for you to do the calculation. I want you to do the calculation and let us see whether our experimental observation is matched by your analytical computation. And what way we will do is, we will try to evaluate the parameters for all the formula that we have learnt. You have to understand when you go for higher studies, you will not have one simple equation, you will have to deal with multiple equations only because the problems are very complex. And we know for sure Arvind's tangent formula is only an approximation and the parameters you need for calculation or A and W, these are available and when you substitute uh, the relevant quantities, I can express the stress intensity factor K 1 equal to 0 0.1781 sigma MPA root meter. Now, what we will have to see is, what is the way we are going to get uh, the results for other formula and compare it with the double edge crack. Now, let me go to the formula by Feddersen, which is a very famous secant formula and you know that it is nothing but sigma root pi a multiplied by secant pi a by w and you also know that this is a empirical relationship based on heuristic arguments and this gives you the value of k 1 as 0 0.193 sigma MPA root meter. So, this gives a value slightly higher than the tangent formula and we also saw one more formula that is Stardust formula that was giving a better accuracy and what was the result that we were getting it in Stardust formula alpha to be taken as 2 a by w. So, you have to get that as 0 0.36 and the formula is like this sigma root pi a multiplied by 1 minus 0 0.025 alpha squared plus 0 0.06 alpha power 4 whole multiplied by secant pi a by w. And when I substitute this the relevant quantities I get the result as 0 0.1678 sigma MPA root meter. So, what you have in the case of central crack, we had three formula, 
each one gave different values only, they are not giving uh, one unique value and the highest value we got was 0 0.183 that is from Feddersen's formula. Now, what we will look at is what way the calculations show for a double edged crack. So, in the double edged crack you have A equal to 8.5 millimeter, W equal to 50 millimeter and you have the expression of Bentham and Coiter seen just recently. And because the length of the crack is different, the value of alpha is 0 0.34, do not substitute the value as 0 0.36 which used for the central crack, you have to substitute only the relevant value of alpha. And when I substitute and do the simplification, I get the value of k 1 as 0 0.1875 sigma MPA root meter, which is definitely higher than the highest value we got for the central crack. In this also we saw two formula, we saw one more formula by Nishitani, we will also have to look at what way the Nishitani gives the results, then only we'll make a final conclusion. So, the result by Nishitani is like this, you have seen the formula just now, the calculation is little lengthy. I think uh, you could write the final result from my slide and go and verify this calculation in your rooms. And what I get here is k 1 equal to 0 0.1933 sigma MPA root meter. So, what you find is the least value that you have got from the double edge crack, he is higher than the highest value you have got from the central crack, but they are very close. See, that is the reason you know some of you have made the specimen very well, you got the fracture occurring at the double edge crack, others who are not given that much precaution for making the crack tip, they had the central crack failing. The story here is the configuration of the crack is also important in deciding the value of SIF. Another knowledge you get is we have to worry about the critical crack for all our discussions. Now, what we will do is we will take up another approach to SIF evaluation using the principle of superposition and you have to keep in mind principle of superposition is applicable because I am in the domain of linear elastic fracture mechanics. If a given loading can be split into simpler loadings for which SIFs are known, then SIF for the original loading is simply the arithmetic sum of the stress intensity factors for the simpler loadings. This I had mentioned earlier also, because the stress field is dictated by whatever the function that you saw, function of r and theta that is identical. The strength is controlled by the stress intensity factor. Suppose I have multiple loadings, each one of them gives the same mode 1 type of loading on the crack faces when the crack faces open up, I could add the stress intensity factors that is what we are going to do in principle of superposition. Here the challenge is how to reduce the given problem as sum or sum and subtraction of simpler problems that is where the challenge lies. And as I mentioned, we are able to do this because the stress components in the neighborhood of a crack is a linear sum of the stress components introduced by simplified loadings is point number 1. Further the stress distribution is unaltered, only its value is controlled by the magnitude of the stress intensity factors. Because of this we are in a position to add or subtract as the case may be of the stress intensity factors. Mind you I am looking only at a particular type of loading. If I do mode 1 loading, I can do for mode 1 loading. If I do for mode 2 loading, those things I can add. I cannot add mode 1 and mode 2, that is not permissible. If 
if I do energy approach, energies can be added, that is a different story. So, do not confuse these two. Now, let us take up a problem of a internally pressurized crack. You need to make neat sketches of this and I have taken a simple strip subjected to uniform tension sigma. There is no crack in this. So, when I do not have a crack, am I justified in saying k 1 a equal to 0? See, I have intentionally taken up the case of a pressurized crack. You know the solution already. We had a discussion on Green's function approach. We had looked at when there is internal pressure, what would be the value of stress intensity factor. The reason why I have taken the same problem now is to get the idea of how people construct sub problems in principle of superposition, that is where the challenge lies. So, I have taken up a sheet without a crack. Now, I will say I can also represent the same problem with a different type of loading. I have a crack, but the crack is closed by another set of loading. So, it is as good as no crack is present. Now, the question arises should I apply only sigma or 2 sigma or 3 sigma? You need to have prior knowledge. Whichever way I put it, it is not going to change because this will cancel each, each other and the crack will remain closed. So, now what I will do is rather than splitting this into sum of problems, here also I recognize because the crack is closed, the stress intensity factor is 0. I will make this as problem A and try to split this into sub problems for which I know the stress intensity factor. So, I am going to rewrite this in this form. I split this as one problem where I have a crack which is subjected to uniaxial tension. Then I take up another problem wherein the crack is closed by the stress sigma. And we have already noted for problem A stress intensity factor is 0. For problem B that is denoted as k 1 b, we know the value of sigma root pi a. So, we can find out what is the stress intensity factor for problem C by looking at this. I can simply say because it is 0, k 1 c is nothing but minus k 1 b, because k 1 b plus k 1 c equal to 0. So, I can find out what is k 1 c and now what I will do? I have got a negative sign here, I am compressing this whereas, I want forces to be applied on the crack surfaces. So, for me to get that kind of a scenario, I reverse the sign of the load, reverse the sign to this way and equate this whatever the stress to the pressure. So, for the pressurized loading of crack faces, the k 1 is p root pi a. You know when you look at principle of superposition to start with, it is little daisy only, because you know you have to have some knowledge and then do addition subtraction. Here we have not done any subtraction deliberately, we will take up another problem where we will do subtraction also. So, the here the training is more on how to write sub problems. If you know how to write sub problems, the problem is solved. So, that is where the focus is and I have taken up an infinite geometry, because I do not want to worry about the correction factors, because any finite geometry I have to come out with a correction factor, which I have avoided by taking infinite geometry. These are like satisfying yourself, because when you want to use stress intensity factor, you would definitely go to a handbook 
and take out values for your relevant problem. But in an academic environment, you should also know how to get those values, what are the principles behind it, that is what we are aiming at. Now, let us take up a problem of a crack from a riveted hole. Suppose, I have a crack emanating from this hole and I have a rivet which is like a pin which would exert a force like this on one direction and you may have some pulling of the whole plate by a stress sigma and the load P is given as sigma W. So, it is a load per unit length and we are considering a unit thickness. Now, apply your mind and see which way you could split this problem into sum and addition of sub problems. So, the whole of superposition, how do you write the sub problems is the challenge. And when you write the sub problem, ensure for the sub problems at least part of it you know the solution for k. If you write a sub problem where you do not know the solution for k, then the purpose is defeated. So, the whole challenge lies only in writing out the sub problems. Let us see how the sub problem can be written. And I would like you to make a sketch of this. So, I take a problem of a crack in a tension strip as one problem. In this, I have these stresses, these stresses have to be cancelled and I do not have any loading on the crack face. So, the problem for which I know the solution is when there is a force acting at the center of the crack on either side, we have a solution. I can add this as another problem and when I look at these two problems, if I have to ma match this to the problem depicted in figure A. I need to subtract another problem which is very similar to the question itself. See the question itself had on the crack face one concentrated force and a distributed load. So, that is cleverly put in the right hand side as to subtract and let us see how to get the stress intensity factor. You know, I could see in some of your, uh, um, some of the students are quite uncomfortable to see this. You know, it will take some time. You know, you will have to uh, try to find out what is the trick behind it. It's not simple, but once you understand this, you can make it simple. That's the way how to look at it, and a very useful approach. So I have K one for the situation A is equal to k 1 B plus k 1 C minus k 1 D. And I do not know what is k 1 D, I can take it uh, similar to this. I know what is k 1 B and k 1 C from which I can find out what is k 1 A. So, when I do that my expression turns out to be like this 1 half of sigma root pi A plus sigma W divided by root of pi A. In fact, in your assignment sheet, I have one or two problems where you can do it by principle of superposition. When you try that out, you will become comfortable. You have to look at that this is one more methodology you have for stress intensity factor evaluation. You have to look at it only from that perspective. And now, what we will do is we will move on to embedded flaws. See how we have proceeded, we had seen through the thickness cracks, now we are going for embedded flaw. And if you look at the literature, the literature has proceeded in this fashion. They have first taken up the problem of embedded circular flaw. See in the case of stress concentration problem also, 
the first problem people solved was plate with a circular hole. Once after they have understood uh, how to solve a problem like this, they graduated to plate with an elliptical hole. In a similar vein, in this case also, we find problem of a circular flaw in, in an infinite body. Here the edges are shown as uh, wavy indicating that it is a flaw in a infinite uh, object. And this was developed in 1946, you know that is where the initial stages of fracture mechanics development. In fact, Snedden in 1946 provided only the stress field, he was able to solve it mathematically, he could provide the stress field. At that time, the expression of k 1 was not available, though I have put here along with the figure k 1 equal to 2 by pi sigma root pi a credited to Snedden, when he reported the work in 1946, he provided only stress field and that is what is summarized here, Snedden in 1946 obtained the exact solution for an embedded circular crack. Little insight to fracture mechanics was gained from the solution. However, some years later the results were re-examined from the LEM point of view and you have got the result for k 1 equal to 2 by pi sigma root pi a. Written in another form it is 0 0.64 sigma root pi a. So, you will be surprised in the initial development of fracture mechanics when whenever any result is obtained people have reflected upon it on many aspects of it. The moment you look at here what happens this is smaller than what is the kind of SIF for a center crack specimen. An embedded flaw is not as dangerous as a throw the thickness crack. And this is the way they reported the analysis. In the case of a circular flaw, you have a curved crack front. The effect of crack front curvature is to decrease the stress intensity factor by 36 percent. This I had mentioned in the through the thickness crack, the crack front is straight, easier to analyze. And when they graduated to circular flaw, fortunately the stress intensity factor was constant on the periphery of the circular flaw, it was not changing. And when they analyzed, they had brought in a conclusion like this and another observation is, because the stress intensity factor is uh, reduced by 36 percent, the crack front curvature tends to stiffen the structure. And like what I had said in the case of stress concentration problem, people graduated from circular hole to elliptical flow. Here also we will find they graduate from circular flaw to elliptical flaw. And this was done by Green and Snedden in 1950 and they initially obtained the crack opening displacement for an embedded elliptical crack. What way they have obtained? They have obtained this as V equal to V naught multiplied by 1 minus x squared by a squared minus y squared by c squared whole power half. Please make a sketch of the elliptical flaw and what do you see strikingly different. See all along we were defining 2 a as the major axis of the ellipse, then we were discussing the throw the thickness crack. The moment you come to embedded flaw and we would also graduate to surface flaw, in all those cases the major axis is given a symbol 2 c and a minor axis is given as 
2 a. This is a nomenclature primarily because that is the length of the crack. The length of the crack is taken as a and the length of the crack definition in through the thickness crack is in one way. In the case of embedded flaw or in the case of surface flaw, a is more relevant that is why the relevant portion is given as a. So, make that uh, observation and put this sketch and this is semi major axis is c, semi minor axis is a. And V naught is a separation of the crack faces at the origin. So, initially Snedden obtained only the crack opening displacement. Arvin in 1962 used strain energy arguments to derive an exact expression for the stress intensity factor at any point around the perimeter of the elliptical crack. And the moment you look at the solution, you will find the solution is very complex, it is not simple. The circular flaw, the stress intensity factor remained constant. On the other hand, the first observation is he determined the stress intensity factor at any point around the perimeter of the elliptical crack. And the stress intensity factor expression is obtained as shown here. See here the edges are given straight for the diagram, still consider this as an infinite body with an elliptical flaw. And the value of k 1 is given as sigma root pi a that is magical in all the problems you will see the sigma root pi a you will see divided by i 2 where i 2 is an elliptical integral we would see what it is. And you have a expression in terms of theta sin square theta plus a by c whole square cos square theta whole power 1 by 4. See this primarily comes from how to locate a point on an ellipse that is also given as a diagram. Just see that diagram carefully. I have an ellipse and I have drawn a circle with the major axis and I have also drawn a circle with the minor axis. Maybe I could uh, enlarge this figure for your convenience. Suppose I want to locate a point on the ellipse, I draw a normal through this, it cuts the ellipse at this point as well as the perimeter of the circle. And when I join this point to the center, this is the angle theta. In other words, when I take an angle theta, I will hit the circle here. When I drop a normal from that to the x axis, it will cut this point. The location is given as c cos theta, comma a sin theta, which can be easily determined. So, it is a parametric representation. Whatever the value of k 1, we have seen that as an expression involving theta, this corresponds to the point shown as green on the ellipse. So, as you change theta, you will get for various points what is the value of stress intensity factor from that expression. How to locate the point for a given theta is depicted in this figure. In fact, if you go back and look at your the various methods of drawing an ellipse, they would do it like this. You can take a circle and compress it into forming an ellipse. And if you look at this distance, this distance is the major axis, the short distance is the minor axis. So, for any vertical line, you maintain the same ratio in terms of major and minor axis and put points, you will get points lying on the ellipse that is from that knowledge only this kind of uh, observation comes. And you also have an expression for the elliptical integral that is given as i 2 equal to integral 0 to pi by 2. You have to evaluate the integral of this function, 
this is 1 minus c squared minus a squared divided by c squared sin squared theta whole power half multiplied by d theta. You know you have tables available to provide this elliptical integral values and people also have developed a series solution take several point, terms in the series and evaluate. And what you have to keep in mind is when you have the location as theta you should know how to locate the point on the ellipse. So, first observation you get this the stress intensity factor on the elliptical front varies from point to point. And how does this varies? You have a minimum as well as a maximum and what we are interested is where the stress intensity factor is maximum because that would decide which way the crack will grow. And if you do the computation, you find the stress intensity factor is a minimum along the major axis and the minimum value of stress intensity factor is given as sigma root pi a divided by i 2 multiplied by root of a by c. And the maximum value occurs on the minor axis. So, k 1 max is sigma root pi a divided by i 2. Since you have some knowledge of fracture mechanics now, what will happen to an elliptical flock? when the loads are increased at some load it has to propagate what would happen to an elliptical flaw. Now, you have a variation the stress intensity factor is a minimum on the major axis it increases it reaches a maximum at the minor axis and then return back to minimum value and this is the story that goes on the boundary of the elliptical flaw. When the load is increased how do you anticipate the elliptical flaw to behave? From your knowledge of fracture mechanics, you can guess because on the minor axis, stress intensity factor is the maximum, only that will try to propel forward. So, an elliptical flaw would try to become a circular flaw, and that is what is summarized here embedded elliptical crack will tend to grow into a circular crack. So, definitely add it adds to your fundamental understanding that is the focus of our academic discussions. And whatever the solution that Arvin has obtained it is termed as that the solution is very general for a circular crack the elliptical integral i 2 becomes pi by 2 and it reduces to the stress intensity factor for a penny shaped crack. See we have done this all along whenever we get a general solution we always take it to particular cases and then ensure that we get the particular value and convince ourselves that our general solution is comprehensive and we are in the right direction that is the way you have to look at it. Now, you have seen a circular crack I can also have a situation where it becomes a straight crack when a is far less than c i 2 becomes 1 and it reduces to the stress intensity factor for a two dimensional crack of length 2 a. And you know more people also have tried to extend the applicability of whatever the results obtained by Arvin and this was done by Tada and Paris in 1979. So, they could say how to handle non elliptical shape internal flaws and this is what they had done. We have to go back to the diagram how we identify the point on the ellipse for a given value of theta and Tada and Paris notice this way. You draw a tangent 
at that point, draw a tangent at this point and drop a normal from there. I have a line which is perpendicular to this tangent and measure the length L and what they noticed was this L is nothing but a multiplied by sin square theta plus a by c whole square cos square theta whole power half. It is a very interesting observation, you know people once they get the solution, they do not leave it at that, they try to find out how much you can extract out of it. That means, you can imagine how people were struggling to unravel mysteries in fraction mechanics, they were trying to find out practical solutions, pragmatic approaches with whatever knowledge that was available. So, make a neat sketch of this and then put this, what you will have to do is you have to put the ellipse and then just put this tangent and the normal, other details you need not spend time and write L equal to so much. And if I go back to the expression for the stress intensity factor, that could be simply written as k 1 equal to sigma root of pi L divided by I 2. So, for any problem at any point on the internal flaw, if you determine the value of L, you can estimate what is k 1. This they have extended to other shapes like this, take time to make a neat sketch. So, you have to measure this length L and if you have another shape like this, you have to measure at the point where you want to find out the stress intensity factor, drop this normal and then find out the length L and if you have a smoothly varying uh, type of situation, put the tangent and drop the normal and find out the value of L. Then stress intensity factor is simply k 1 equal to sigma root pi L divided by I 2. So, it is as simple as this. So, from elliptical flaw, you can go to non elliptical shapes, that is one aspect of the extension. From elliptical flaw, you can come down to circle and then to a straight throw the thickness crack. So, what we have done is we have convinced ourselves that whatever the expression that we have developed are consistent with our built up of knowledge. With all this rigor and broad range of applicability, Irwin's result is of only limited practical utility, unless we extend the results to surface cracks. Because our ultimate objective is to find out stress intensity factor for surface cracks. And they are the most uh, challenging and complex problems. And if we have to go to that, we have to have this background and we will see how these solutions can be modified suitably. And the very first question that you will have to raise when you go to surface crack is this, how surface cracks can be modeled. I have a nice picture here, maybe I will magnify it. You have a specimen and there is a surface crack and this surface crack shape is taken and put into an ellipse and the courtesy for the figure is given here. So, what you find here is the surface crack which is present in this object can be modeled 
as a semi elliptical crack. That modeling is reasonably good because we can handle only that, you have to understand that. We want to solve the problem of surface crack, before I apply it for surface crack, I have to model what is the reasonable approximation for surface cracks and that is what is shown here and surface crack initiates at one phase of the specimen, but does not go all the way to the other phase like through the thickness crack. Surface cracks are usually modeled as semi ellipses in the literature of fracture mechanics. So, in this class what we had done was, we had looked at the stress intensity factor for a double edged crack, then we mathematically obtained the stress intensity factor for the experiment we did a few classes away, consisting of a center crack and a double edged crack and we totally convinced ourselves that it is only the double edge crack that fails, because the stress intensity factor is higher than the center crack. So, common sense fails, the sum of the double edge crack length is only 17 millimeter, whereas the center crack length was 18 millimeter. Even though the double edge crack was shorter than that, this precipitated the fracture. Then we moved on to embedded flaws we looked at stress intensity factor for a circular flaw, then the elliptical flaw, then we said from elliptical flaw we will graduate to surface cracks and we have also shown surface cracks can be modeled as semi elliptical flaw. Thank you.